Us. Welcome. We're going to be talking about uh, Rethinking Human Nature, Chapter 3 uh, in the Corcoran text. Um, and we're going to sort of jump right in. Uh, so far we've been talking about dualism, various forms of dualism. We talked about materialism last lecture, a couple different kinds of materialism. So a few things. One, um, yes, I'm trying to confuse you. And that is why uh, I continually change my look. Sometimes, you know, I look like I've showered in these videos. Sometimes not. Sometimes i got a beard. Sometimes not. Um, I'm, I'm keeping on your toes. I'm keeping you guessing. Uh, we're going to sort of talk about personal identity and uh, some of this stuff. And I'm sort of trying to muddy the waters with uh, my deceptive looks. So don't be fooled. Uh, it's the same person in all the videos. Um, so Corcoran, uh, one of his uh, primary arguments in the, the particular text that we're reading is that he's trying to provide a third alternative to dualism and materialism. So he's sort of inserting his constitution view, which is often referred to as CV in the PowerPoint and in the book, um, as a third way, or he calls it a middle way, an alternative to the two. Um, and I think it is. A legitimate alternative to the other two. But I do want to make uh, a note of clarity, and I think that Corcoran communicates this in the book, but sometimes students miss it. So this is vital. Uh, Corcoran is a cosmological dualist. And what that means is if you take a big picture look at the cosmos, the universe, all of creation, Corcoran is, in fact, a dualist because he believes that God is an immaterial substance. God is a spirit, not always embodied. God can be embodied, like in the person of Jesus, but God is not always embodied. God is often disembodied. And so you have an immaterial, spiritual God, and then God creates a physical creation made up of matter, right? So in a cosmological sense, you have a dualism. You've got God, immaterial, creation, material, right? non-physical, physical. But once you start getting into creation and looking at creation specifically, he's no longer a dualist. So when it comes to the human person, Corcoran does not think we have spirit and body. He does not think that we have this immaterial soul that sort of is latched on to our physical existence, our, our matter, our bodies. Cosmological dualist between God and creation, but once you get into creation, he's not a dualist anymore. And so he's sort of putting forth this constitution view um, as an alternative when we talk about the human person. Now this helps corporate avoid some problems, right? So he doesn't deny the spiritual world. He doesn't deny that God is immaterial. This allows God to be omnipresent, fundamentally other than humans in creation, right? It allows for a lot of those things. It's going to be relevant for life after death and all of that uh, when we get into there. Um, but at the same time, when looking at the human person, he thinks the evidence and the best philosophical arguments and the best data we have from science suggest we are physical bodies. And our thoughts, how we feel, and the things we do are intimately tied to our brains. And so he, he looks at humans in a very physical sense, um, although we've been created by a spiritual God. So I hope that helps clarify some things. The key claim of the Constitution view here, we are constituted by our bodies without being identical to our bodies. Constituted by our bodies, not identical. And this is going to be an important distinction, and we're going to spend time in this lecture really parsing through what that means. One of the things that he mentions in the introduction and is reiterated a couple of times, and again, I want to drive the point home a little bit, Corcoran and myself um, really want to take the goodness of creation seriously. In the history of theology, in the history of the church, there was some real dispute. Um, you had those um, who wanted to deny the goodness of creation, that essentially the physical was evil. That's where our evil nature came from. Um, 
Augustine and others talk about it coming from the seed of man, that that's where the child gets their original sin from. Um, often the idea was sex was a necessary evil to procreate, but it was not a good thing. The body itself, bad. And so what we needed to do is focus, contemplate on God, which required our souls uh, to sort of become a disembodied self. And when we die, of course, we can finally be detached from this evil physical world and dwell with God in a spiritual world. Um, this is often referred to as like Gnosticism. Um, Marcion and others uh, in classical theology sort of held some of these views and advocated them, like the Marcionites. And this is a real debate. And in fact, uh, Gnostics often would deny uh, that Jesus had a physical body like ours. They would talk about it in terms of an ethereal body and other things, because if God embodied matter like ours, they would have to see it as being evil. Like God, Jesus couldn't be wholly good. He would have to participate in sort of this original sin. Um, and so they wanted to talk about a sort of disembodied or an ethereal body, Jesus. Um, Corcoran rejects this. I do. Orthodox Christianity does as well. To say, no, God in creation creates and says it is good. That creation is, in fact, God's, and God is in the process of reconciling creation to himself. God is in the process of redeeming creation. The vision of the eschaton, the vision of, of the end, is a banquet table, a feast, where God is reconciled to God's people, and then we dine together, right? It's of a new heaven and a new earth that God would redeem all of creation, that Jerusalem coming down out of the sky to take its rightful place on earth, right, with God as king and us entering into God's kingdom, that this creation will not be destroyed and just cast away, but in fact redeemed and restored. So Corcoran takes this particular view of creation, that God is intent on reconciling and redeeming all of creation, that the physical world is not evil in any sense, but infused with the divine, the incarnation is very important here, that Jesus takes on a physical body and this does not make Jesus evil. Jesus comes and shows us what it means to be fully human, um, right? Humanity perfected, uh, a, a version of humanity that images God um, with clarity and love and precision. And so this incarnation suggests that God is here to restore and redeem um, the created world, not to destroy it. Um, for God so loved the world that he came to save the world, right? To re reconcile the world. So Corcoran takes this theological track um, and really emphasizes the physical and the body when it comes to human persons. And I do as well. Um, that we cannot separate that which is spiritual from that which is physical when it comes to humans that it's tied together, that I am fundamentally constituted by my body, and whatever it means to be a spiritual person is going to be fundamentally tied into my physicality, and my body, and my brain, and my locatedness. And that those two things do not need to be separate. This is going to be a huge point for me throughout the course, that we don't just separate the spirit from the body, but that we look at ourselves as holistic human beings, spirit and body intertwined, maybe even codependent on each other, and whatever it means to be a spiritual person is going to have a lot to do with what it means to be a physical body in the world. So when we talk about spiritual formation, I'm going to tie it to moral formation, character formation. What I do with my body, what I do with my life, the actions that I pursue, that is my spiritual life. My life is my spiritual life. What I do with my character in terms of virtue and morality, that is spiritual formation, right? Character formation is spiritual formation. So I'm going to sort of make this claim throughout the course, and part of this is what it means to be human, and I think in many respects it means to be a physical body in the world. So I agree with Corcoran. Corcoran. I'm a cosmological dualist. God is immaterial. Creation is material. Um, when it comes to humans, I'm more of a monist. But we'll get into that some. So... Uh, this idea of, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back, this idea that we are constituted by our bodies without being identical to our bodies, right? To help explain this, he uses the example of a copper statue, right? 
So let's read here. The copper is not identical to the copper statue. Changes can destroy one without destroying the other. Thus, the copper is not identical to the copper statue. Right? Changes in one, changes can destroy one without destroying the other. So think about that. Take a copper statue and melt it. Do you still have copper? Yes. The copper has not been destroyed. Has the statue been destroyed? Yes. It's no longer the same statue. Changes destroyed the statue. It didn't destroy the copper. Well, then the copper statue and the copper are not identical. And that's important. You can take a statue and hammer it flat. You've destroyed the statue. You have not destroyed the copper. The two are not identical. But the copper statue is constituted by the copper. The copper statue doesn't exist without the copper, but they're not identical. Keep this in mind as we begin to talk about what it means to be a person, our identity, and then bodies. What's that relationship? So we jump down here. Copper is necessary in order to make a copper statue. You cannot have a copper statue without copper. Copper is necessary for the copper statue. But copper is not sufficient for the statue. You need copper to have a copper statue, but having copper is not enough for a copper statue. It's necessary for the statue, but not sufficient. Right? One needs an artist to have a copper statue. One needs for it to have a particular form. A lot of things have to shape the copper in order to make it into a copper statue. So the actual copper is necessary. You can't have the statue without it. But it's not sufficient because you need more than just the copper for the statue. Again, they're not identical. Another way to say this. The copper statue's identity cannot be reduced to the material that constitutes it. Remember we talked about materialism last time? They want to say what it means to be human can be reduced to what it means to be a body. I am identical to my brain and my body. Nothing but. That's a reductionary argument. The Constitution view says no. I, might, I need my body, but I can't be reduced to my body. I'm more than that. Right? The copper statue, uh, this copper statue's identity as a statue cannot be reduced to the copper. It's more than just copper. It's copper in a particular form, with particular intent, for a particular purpose. It's not just copper. It can't be reduced. This is vital that you see the difference between materialism and this constitution view. One is a reductionary argument. The other is not a reductionary argument. Cannot be reduced. So let's talk about constitution relationships generally. Things that share a con two things share a constitutional relationship if, one, the two things share the same matter. So I can be in a constitutional relationship with something if we share the same matter, the same stuff. With regard to the copper statue, the copper statue and the copper are made up of the same stuff, right? And the two things in this constituted relationship are of different kinds. We're made up of the same stuff, but we're of different kinds. The copper and the copper statue are the same stuff, but they are different kinds, different forms of the copper that the copper can take. And so we have a constituted relationship with regard to the copper statue. How might this relate to being a human person and the relationship between being a person with an identity and having a body? What's the relationship between personhood and bodies? So I want you to think about this just for a few minutes, a few seconds maybe before I continue on. How would the copper and the copper statue relate to personhood and bodies? Right? Which is the copper? Which is the copper statue? Could there be similarities there? All right, person, bodies, and constitution. Corcoran argues that minimally, he's not giving a formal definition, he's just saying there are some minimal standards for persons, right? For a human to be a person. Uh, persons are beings, minimally, with a capacity for intentional states. 
believing, desiring, intending, willing, right? Intentional states. Persons also have, must have, a first person perspective. That is, I have the ability to think of oneself, the ability to think of oneself as oneself. That I can step back and think, I'm, I'm getting hungry right now. What does that mean? I can lay on bed at night and think about the fact that I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking right now, because I'm a thinking thing, right? This first person self-reflective ability. So persons minimally have intentional states and a first person perspective. For Corcoran, human persons are essentially constituted by biological bodies. This is a third key element. Human persons are essentially constituted by biological bodies. This is key, essentially. I cannot survive, I cannot exist if my body ceases to exist. I am essentially constituted by my body. If my body ceases to exist, I cease to exist. Okay? Now, my body can continue to exist without me existing as a person, right? My body can continue to exist without me existing. For instance, in death, my body often continues to exist, but, but my identity, me as a person, ceases to exist. But certainly, I cannot exist without my body existing, right? My personhood identity, right, my personhood or my identity, is not identical to my body. Okay, this is key. I am essentially constituted by my body, but I am not identical to my body. Changes can destroy one without destroying the other, just like the copper statue. Thus, I am not identical to my body. I just gave an example. Changes can destroy one without destroying the other. In death, I, as a person and as someone who has an identity, is destroyed. My body can continue to exist. Changes in one destroy, changes destroy one but do not destroy the other. They're not identical. I can experience a severe brain injury and cease to be a person. I can no longer have ident uh, intentional states. I no longer have a first person perspective. All those things that we need to be persons are gone, but I can be on machines and still existing in the hospital. Changes can destroy my identity, my personhood, without destroying my body, completely at least. So I am not identical to my body. This it means I can't be reduced to my body the way the materialist wants. The materialist wants to say there's an identity. Remember the person-body identity? Corcoran's saying no. Persons are not identical to bodies. Here's the key, and this is directly parallel to the copper example. My body is necessary in order for me to be a person. I can't be a person without my body. That's how I exist. But my body is not sufficient for personhood. My body is necessary for personhood, just like the copper is necessary for a copper statue. But my body is not sufficient for me to be a person, just like the copper is not sufficient for it to be a copper statue. This is going to come up in chapters uh, that we're going to be reading, um, but a person can have a body, but excuse me, you can have a body and not be a person. That means bodies are not sufficient for personhood. We just talked about the serious brain injury. Because I'm going to need, in order to be a person, I need intentional states, I need a first person perspective and whatnot. Body is necessary, not sufficient for personhood. Personhood cannot be reduced to the material it constitutes. Excuse me. Personhood cannot be reduced to the material it constitutes it. Personhood cannot be reduced to the body. Dependent on it. Okay, so this is the really other question. What is the more than? Right? What does it mean to say that I am dependent on my body, I need my body to exist, but that I am not reducible to my body? Right? What is the more? So I'm dependent on my body, I'm essentially constituted by my body, but I can't be reduced to my body. I'm more than my body. If I am more than my body, what is the more than? 
This is a key question. It's something that I would throw back to you as well. What do you think is the more than? Right? What is Corcoran referring to here? I think there's lots of potential answers, but I'm curious to get your gears turning. For Corcoran, he's mentioned a few things like intentional state and first-person perspective. With that comes moral awareness. I am fundamentally this body and this brain that's active. My consciousness emerges out of these physical processes. Now I can begin to think. I'm aware of myself. I have a first-person perspective. I can will, desire, intend, choose. This all emerges from my body, and for corporate, it would not emerge without the body. Once it does, though, all of a sudden now, I'm morally aware. I have the ability to love. Consciousness and first-person perspectives allows me to choose faith or not, hope or not. All of these higher-order things sort of emerge from our bodies, from our brains, but they can't be reducible. They're, they can't be reduced to our brains. It's more than. I am now a person with spiritual awareness, the ability to connect to God, a conscience where guilt resides. All of these things are fundamentally tied to my bodies, but not reducible to my bodies. You can't pinpoint in the brain where my moral awareness lies, my spiritual awareness and whatnot. So I think this is what he means by the more than, right? Let's transition briefly um, and talk a little bit. He talks about persistence conditions. Bodies persist through time. Persons persist through time. This is a little bit of a philosophical quandary, and I want to address it just briefly. He does it in the reading, but I want to do it briefly. Right? Bodies and persons persist through time. What is the connection? For instance, I don't have any of the same cells I did when I was three years old, two years old. I don't even have it. I think it's every seven years. All of your cycles at some point are replenished. So I guess even since I was in my 20s, I don't have the same cells. But let's go back even, let's say six, when I was six months old till now, I don't have any of the same cells. I don't look the same. I don't think the same. I'm different in almost every single way you can be different. Well, how do I know it's the same body? We'll start there, right, with bodies. How do I know it's the same body? This is a difficult thing to answer in philosophy, right? It's this notion of identity persisting through time. Every single thing about me is different. Most things are different if you thought, I mean, from when I was 18, I look really different. My cells, biologically, I'm different. My thought process, my view of morality, all kinds of things are different. My perspective, why am I? What makes it the same body? Corcoran's answer is that causal, there's a causal connection to the past. He calls it an imminent causal connection, or ICC. Right? Bodies persist through time in virtue of atoms and cells that are caught up in a life-preserving causal relation. So when I was six months, the atoms and cells that made up that six-month-old baby were caught up in a life-preserving causal relation to one another that kept me going. And those, the causal relationship at that time passed on, right, the life-preserving causal relation to when I was seven months old, and then eight months old, and nine months old. There's a succession of causal relationships through time that can connect my 36-year-old body to my six-month-old body, right? The atoms that were caught up in this life-preserving relationship then can be tied all the way to where I'm at now. So that causal connection that lets me know it's the same body. Same thing, what makes me the same person, right? Persistent conditions of persons. How am I the same person that I was when I was six months old? Six months old. So different in every way, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, right? So for Corcoran, first, the persistence conditions for one's body must hold, because remember, I'm dependent on my body for my existence. So, um, so we have to have that causal relationship according to our bodies. And the persisting physical organism must also preserve the capacity for a range of intentional states 
a constant first-person perspective, so that these things, again, have a causal relationship to the past that allows for me to know that it's the same body and that I'm the same person, even through all of these changes. And of course, this is relevant when we're talking about persons and bodies, what allows us to have that sense of constancy through time. So now we come to some big questions with regard to the Corcoran chapter. I can't answer them all. Again, you need to do the reading, and I think Corcoran is going to address these in more detail, but I want to at least say a few things about each. These are the kinds of questions that I were you that, that I would have. If I were you, I would have these questions, right? What about the incarnation with regard to Jesus? What of the imago Dei, or the image of God? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? And what about life after death, given the Constitution view? Right? Do these three things get destroyed if the Constitution view is true? You can look uh, pages 80 to 82, Corcoran tries to address some of these. I'll do them sort of in order. Incarnation. Corcoran argues that the Constitution view provides a better notion of the incarnation than, say, dualism. So Jesus, we hold to be one person with two natures, wholly human and wholly divine. Corcoran says his constitution view holds up. Human persons are physical bodies. That what, that's what constitutes us as humans. And Jesus has that human nature. Jesus has a human body, and that, that's what constitutes his human nature. Jesus is also divine, and so he has an immaterial part of him that we do not have as humans. But Jesus, being the Son of God, being fully divine, has this immaterial divine element that connects to that body. And so Jesus is both fully human, constituted by a body, and divine, an immaterial right, kind of divinity. Thus, two natures, one person. But he says, think about how this looks from a dualistic perspective, because then we get it strikes very odd. From a dualistic perspective of the human person, Jesus would be human, which means Jesus would have a human body and a human soul, because that's what makes up a human person. And then Jesus would have this third element, the divine nature. So the human nature encompasses both the body and the immaterial soul. And then all of a sudden, Jesus has this third thing, the divine element, but that seems to muddy the waters, right? Rather than having two natures, it seems that Jesus almost has three. And what is it that persists through time for Jesus after death? Is it the human soul, the divine soul? How does that look? And so for Corporate, he says, none of these problems exist in the Constitution view. It actually simplifies matters with regard to the Incarnation. What about the Imago Dei? I, I'm sorry. There's room for disagreement in all of this. I, I hope this stimulates a really good conversation on the discussion boards, that you have questions, comments, disagreements. I'm just sort of giving you Corcoran's view. I'm not expecting you to agree. Um, what about the Imago Dei? Um, in, I mean, one of the things Corcoran makes clear, he does not think the Imago Dei means that we are created with an immaterial soul the way God is immaterial. He says, I don't believe that. I think we're constituted by our bodies essentially. So then what would it mean to be created in the image of God? And here Corcoran says, well, lots of things. One, human beings can image God by creating. God is creative fundamentally, and as humans create both children, art, right, beauty, music, we image God as creator. The Trinity shows that God is fundamentally relational. Even within God's nature, there's relationship between the three components of the divine nature. Human beings are fundamentally relational. We live and exist and are born into communities in the church. We can't survive without relationships. This is what, right, what drives us in many respects. We image God to the extent that we're relational. We have a moral awareness. We image God to the extent that we make moral choices. We have the capacity to love. We image God to the extent that we love. And so he says we are created in the Imago Dei for these various reasons that have nothing to do with the immaterial soul. And then finally, life after death, which um, he hasn't talked a lot about. Um, he's talked some, and we'll talk more. I don't want to give too much away, but Corcoran will advocate a bodily resurrection. 
In this case, he's more Jewish, right? Um, a bodily resurrection, right? When Jesus, when they come to the tomb, Jesus' body is gone. It's not just his spirit that went to heaven, or descended and then went to heaven. His very body was gone. When Jesus returns, he has a body, a redeemed and renewed body, still with scars. Still with scars. Same body. Just redeemed and renewed by God. Corbin wants to say this is the vision of the resurrection. This is the vision of the afterlife. That our very bodies would be resurrected. That God would establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And that we would dwell in that kingdom. That is the vision of the eschaton, right, when Christ returns. It's a bodily resurrection. Now, uh, agree or disagree, that's fine. But that's how he argues that his constitution view is compatible with um, a life after death. So uh, I hope this stimulates conversation and that you enjoyed it. I look forward to seeing you online.